Oh my god, they're dead! Who could have done such a heinous act? I bet it was that frog down by the swamp. I don't like that frog. He's got them shifty eyes. It was that escaped convict, Ironjaw, that rapscallion. I bet it was that strange shadowy figure that likes to swing in the park on Thursday nights. I swear to you, it was my stuffed panda. He's, he's possessed. It could have been Ricky's arm. We haven't seen it since it got cut off. I definitely know who the killer is. That is way. Way. Blank is the killer. Ha. Huh. Greetings. What's up, dogs? Welcome to Blank is the Killer, an unoriginal horror movie podcast that I decided I would use as a platform to hypnotize the masses. Now, why did I decide to do this? It's nothing new. Well, I was going to watch a horror movie that I had never seen every day in the month of October and decided why not glue some sort of creative outlet to that since I was going to be watching 31 movies anyway. And with that being said, let's just jump right into it. Number one, The Mutilator, 1984, directed by Buddy Cooper. A son accidentally shoots and kills his mother while cleaning his dad's gun, which causes his dad to become an insane killer who years later demands his now college-age son to come and winterize his beach condo. The son brings his friends with him for a short vacation thing, and the murdering starts. Daddy is the killer, And strangely enough, there is no twist that the son is in cahoots with him. Everyone but the son and his martial art master, virgin girlfriend, dies in various ways while the GF ends up killing the killer. It seems like good old Buddy Cooper wanted this to be a hybrid slasher comedy, but only in some instances. Uh, One scene in particular that pops out as a weird attempt at this is when the jokester character just wants to lay his girlfriend... And she says he'll get some action, but only after the jokester finds their other friends and locks up the house. This prompts him to jump up and basically zoom out of the room like he's been turned to fast forward mode in that strangely depressing, forgettable Adam Sandler flick. Another scene has a jump scare where the thing you're supposed to be spooked by is a giant cartoonish cutout of a prospector. And all that really did was remind me of Toy Story 2. It did seem like you were supposed to be scared there, but all I could picture was Woody getting his arm ripped by that prospector in Toy Story 2, which, come to think of it, is uh, scarier than that scene. There is an incredibly strange music choice, which reminded me of those jams you would hear waiting at the dentist's office. If you end up watching the movie, you'll know exactly what music I'm talking about. And I don't think that was supposed to be comedic, I just think that's what kind of music they decided to compose there. The poster for this movie says, By sword, by pick, by axe, by bye. And unfortunately, we don't actually get a sword or pick kill. Uh, That being said, there are a bunch of different means used to kill college-age kids and police officers and people just wandering around on the beach in this movie. And a battle axe is predominantly used in the film, which is... Quite interesting, because you don't see a lot of battle axe usage. There were a couple of standouts. Uh, There was a kill where the dad basically grabs a motor uh, for a boat, which has the propeller on it, turns it on, and then just starts digging into the stomach of one of the college boys. And in this scene, it basically goes back from the dad with some blood splatter back to the college boy screaming and he kind of does like the same scream through the uh, throughout the entire process and so you have this back and forth which is kind of comedic and uh, on the opposite end of the spectrum there is a kill where a girl gets hooked by a giant fish hook from a hoo-ha to stomach which was incredibly unsettling and Probably the most yeesh-inducing kill of the week. I'd say give this one a watch if you're into slashers. Uh, It was a pretty fun film and a great way to start off the month. 
A fun fact from this movie is the kid that plays the grown-up son actually ended up doing some side character voice work for the amazing, fantastic show, Pokemon. Number two, The House on Sorority Row, 1983, directed by Mark Rosman. A lady has a freak baby that we are led to believe is dead. She then becomes a house mother at a sorority. The sorority girls there pull the classic, shoot the old lady to make her get into the pool prank, but we're not actually going to shoot her. This backfires, making the girls think they killed the house mother, and then the girls start getting murdered by allegedly the old lady who is still alive. It's later revealed that she's still dead, and the freak baby from the beginning lived to avenge mommy's death. The freak baby all grown up is the killer. The final girl is a wet blanket that allegedly kills the freak baby, only to have the movie end with a classic killer opens his eyes moment. First off, I would like to talk about the amazing prank that ended up causing a freak baby to avenge his mother's death. Do you remember when you were a kid, pulled a gun out on an old lady and tried to force her to get into a grimy pool by threatening her life? There's no funnier prank than just straight up assault. Anyways, the gun is shown to be loaded when the girl that's handling it shoots out a lamppost. It's then shown to have some blanks in it when we think she shot her friend, but it's revealed that that was part of the prank and she didn't actually shoot her. And then it's also shown to have blanks when after they get the old lady in the pool, they decide to pretend to shoot her three times. But then, it's never really revealed if the old lady is shot or not. When she gets out of the pool, the gun goes off again, which makes her go back into the pool. There's no blood or anything. We're never actually 100% sure if she was just shocked at the gun going off again, even though she didn't really seem to care much about the three fake shots when she was actually standing in the grody pool. Later in the movie, the final girl shoots the gun at the freak baby, point blank to no effect, so it does seem that the girl who had the gun originally put some real bullets in and some blanks in it. Anyway, the old lady has a dope bird cane. It's a metal bird on top and it just looks super fresh. Basically, this cane is sharp. Sharp on the bottom, sharp on the bird beak, sharp on the bird tail. This cane is used for pretty much all of the kills. Only one of the kills from the freak baby isn't done by the bird cane. Uh, that kill is basically a girl trying to defend herself with a butcher knife, only to have it pushed back into her, causing her to lose her head. And this leads to a pretty cool scene uh, a little bit later on, when her decapitated head reanimates in a toilet bowl when the final girl of the film starts tripping balls off a sedative. The whole tripping ball sequence is really cool and probably my favorite part of the movie. Other odd standout moments in the film, there's a chubby dude in tidy whities who decides to jump in the gross ass pool and he refers to himself as a sea pig twice. There's another part where two sorority sisters are slowly pushing a dumpster that contains the alleged body of the old woman to dump the body somewhere away from the crime. And so while they're doing this, and they're pushing it slowly, it's not going downhill or anything, they just push it like straight up into a cop car. Nothing really comes of this, it's just like, how do you accidentally push a dumpster that you're pushing with a corpse inside of it into a parked cop car? I mean, there's literally no way they could have avoided that. Anyway, the film ends with the final girl killing the freak baby with a doll. It's kind of one of the most interesting parts of the movie since pretty much all the other kills are done by the bird cane in pretty similar fashions, being stabbed by the bird cane, being slashed by the bird cane. But with this kill, she basically takes a doll, removes its head, which reveals like a metal rod that the head was attached by, and then she just starts stabbing the freak baby man to death with the doll. And so she keeps stabbing and stabbing. He falls out of the attic where the scene was taking place. And then you pretty much think everything's done. Uh, you know, we have that scene where he opens his eyes, which is just one of those great tropes you expect. 
So we'll technically say that the freak baby didn't die. Overall, this was a pretty fun movie. Um, I'd recommend giving it a go. Uh, fun fact, the director went on to direct episodes of Lizzie McGuire and Even Stevens. There was also a remake of this movie back in 2009, but it's probably trash. I haven't seen it. If I'm wrong, let me know. Maybe I'll check it out. Number three, Cub, or is known in Belgium, Welp, 2014, directed by Jonas Gavaerts. This was a movie from Belgium. Scouts go camping in a forest, allegedly containing a Kai, uh, which is kind of said to be a werewolf thing. Once there, a crazy man living in a bunker and a woodland feral child start a killing. A troubled boy named Sam then either becomes the new feral kid after murdering the old one at the end, or the feral kid is his twin brother that he lost since he's a foster kid that didn't really know his family. Who knows? It's, it's impossible to know in this film. The Bunker Man and Feral Kid slash Baby Sam are the killers. This movie was put together fairly well. My biggest gripe is with the bad ending. There is no resolution and you're not really sure what happened. The gore never looks fake. Mostly everything apart from the bees appears to have been done in a practical way, which is awesome since this is a recent movie. The best kill of the movie is by far the Rube Goldberg B arrow kill. And basically what happens is a trap is triggered, a ball starts rolling, it then launches an arrow which goes through a beehive, takes the beehive with it, and lands in the stomach of a French thug. Getting shot by an arrow sucks enough, uh, but it's a Especially terrible when there's an active beehive attached to it. The design for the feral kid is incredible. He's this muddy kid with this terrifying tree ant esque demon mask, which makes him look like he jumped right out of Pan's Labyrinth. One warning I will say about the film is there is some violence against a dog. Uh, most of it is done while the dog is in a burlap sack, but it is still something that a lot of people don't want to see because it's completely fine when some idiot college kids get dismembered, but no one wants to see a poor pup get hurt. Overall, I liked Cub, better name Welp, even though the ending was pretty poor. I would still recommend the film because there is some really cool stuff in there. The set design is incredible and a lot of the visuals of the movie are pretty great. Now we're going to do a quick segment I have deemed 30 seconds to live. Anyone who watches a movie with me is given 30 seconds to give their thoughts. This week we have Cat. Cat, you have 30 seconds to live. Cub was a pretty good movie that kind of lost the plot a little bit there at the end. Uh, there is a lot of exposition and backstory that was really interesting that you really, really thought was going to pay off, and then it just kind of didn't. Um, I think maybe it was supposed to be like open-ended for you to think about, but it really, really bugged me, and I wanted a complete ending that explained everything. So that really annoyed me. But I really like the Boy Scout elements. And dead. If you're interested in being part of the segment 30 Seconds to Live, just hit me up. We do have a very in-depth vetting process, and there is a huge long list of nobody. So just let me know, and yeah, we'll watch a movie. Number four, Hatchet, 2006, directed by Adam Green. Two friends join a swamp tour with a newbie guide, elderly couple, brooding girl, amateur actresses, and sleazy fake porn director where they encounter the ghost of Victor Crowley. Vicky C. is the killer, and everyone but the brooding girl, Mary Beth, dies. You find that out in the sequel, though. This movie is an homage to past slashers. It pulls heavily from Friday the 13th. It does have a strange, low-budget, dated feel, but you forget all of that once they get to the swamp. There are some familiar faces for horror fans, Robert England plays a gator hunter that's torn in half. Tony Todd is a quick cameo in this one with a much larger role in the second as a shop slash tour owner. And Kane Hodder, the first person to play Jason Voorhees multiple times, plays Vicky C. 
he goes on to play Victor Crowley in all three sequels as well. The practical gore effects in this movie are pretty incredible. People are routinely decapitated and torn in half. My favorite kill is probably when the sleazy porn director gets his head twisted off. Or when the old lady gets the top of her head pulled off from the top jaw. This is a good movie for head destruction. The dialogue was actually pretty funny and there are some great mannerisms from the actors. Especially from Dion Richmond of Cosby Show, Sister to Sister, Psych, and from where I remember in most fame, Scream 3. I also really like Joel David Moore's character, and he's probably best known for his appearance as JP in Grandma's Boy. There's also what I consider to be one of the most fantastic off-screen deaths. One of the girls is supposed to be a lookout. Another part of the group see her bloody clothes pop up and start screaming to warn the main character, who's trying to get gas out of Victor's cabin. Right after they start screaming, the main character in the cabin starts getting pelted by just random body parts of the girl. It's hilarious and one of my favorite scenes in the movie. Speaking of things being randomly thrown, this movie just loves to throw buckets of blood at trees, which I considered very hilarious. Uh, it made me laugh pretty much every single time. They just do it over and over and it's fantastic. An interesting fact about this one is it won Best Picture at Fantastic Fest. I'd easily recommend the first Hatchet. That being said. Number 5. Hatchet 2, 2010. Directed by Adam Green. This movie starts right where we left off with Hatchet. The final girl, Mary Beth, escapes the clutches of Victor Crowley, finds out her dad is one of the three kids responsible for the fire that killed Victor Crowley, she gathers up a group of hunters with Tony Todd's help, then goes back to try and kill Vicky C. once and for all. Vicky C. again is the killer. This movie recasts Mary Beth, and the new actress just does not do it for me. Her character in the first part is badass. She can take care of herself. She's awesome. In this one, she seems like a scared kid that can't do anything herself for most of the movie. A lot of charm of the original is also gone. While the original had a lot of pretty funny lines and events, almost all of the comedy attempts in this movie fall flat. The practical effects and gore and kill creativity are still great though. I planned to watch the entire series but decided to stop after this one. This movie ups the blood splashes on trees which is one of my favorite things in the first one. I will admit there are actually a ton of amazing kills in this one. For example, Vicky C uses a ridiculously sized chainsaw to cut two dudes in half, balls up, at the same time. A guy also gets the top of his head removed by a curb stomp. Well, it's actually a table stomp. Which causes the top of his head to slide on the table and cheesily blink. There is a scene where a character gets his intestines pulled out and he is then choked to death with his own intestines. This reminded me of a scene in the movie Ricky O, The Story of Ricky, which is a movie I highly recommend. Also, one of the hunters gets his face removed with a boat propeller, and that kind of reminded me of that amazing kill I loved from the first movie this week, The Mutilator. In the end of this one, Victor Crowley is allegedly killed by Mary Beth after she hits him multiple times in the face with a hatchet and then follows it up with a shotgun blast also to the face. But we know that ain't the end. I'd have to say skip this one. It's unfortunate because after watching the first one, I really thought I was going to have a new series to watch and wanted to finish out the week with every single film, but just couldn't bring myself to do it after the disappointment that was Hatchet 2. Number 6, Demons 2, 1986. Directed by Lamberto Bava. A group of teens go into the Forbidden Zone, where their journey is somehow broadcast to an entire apartment complex, allowing a demon they encounter to jump through a girl's television, which starts the spread of the demon infection to the entire building. Teenage curiosity, television, or a demon infection is the killer. This is the follow-up to the amazing movie Demons, both films are directed by Lamberto Bava and produced by Dario Argento of Suspiria fame. This movie was 
Argento's youngest daughter, Asia Argento's first role. She was only 10 in this film. Her most known role being Yelena in Triple X with the very talented and amazing Vin Diesel. I'll talk more about Dario Argento next week after I watch his film Inferno. The director's father, Mario Bava, was also a famous director that did a lot of great horror films. Like Dario, I plan to go a little more in-depth on him next week after I watch his film Black Sunday. Demons 2 is an incredibly fun movie. The practical effects are fantastic. There are multiple demon transformations, from a demon coming back to life, a girl transforming into one, a dog transforming into one, and even a weird, gremlin-like demon bursting out of a child's chest. All the makeup for the demons is creepy, slimy, and awesome. The acting is pretty bad in most parts, just like most of the other films I've seen from Bava and Argento, but the acting in no way detracts from the enjoyment of the film. And I might even go to say that their movies are more enjoyable because of the cheesy acting. This movie really isn't about crazy creative kills, since it's more of a zombie movie. The demons scratch or bite others in order to turn them, so I don't really count people being turned into demons or the demons getting killed by uninfected humans to be all that amazing um, since it's not really the focal point of the film. But there is one exception and that would be the weird gremlin. A child persuades a pregnant lady to let him into her apartment where as soon as she opens the door he reveals he's a demon kid and ends up getting in. After chasing her around the house, he falls to the ground and a weird demon gremlin thing jumps out and starts to terrorize the woman. The whole time the woman is being terrorized by this gremlin thing, it is making these shrill, creepy kid screams. The whole interaction is actually pretty funny, but the sounds the thing makes are surprisingly disturbing. During an attempt to kill the gremlin, the woman casually pulls out a jar of acid, as everyone back in the day would own, and tries to melt the demon. This doesn't work, but her husband comes home just in time to push an entire umbrella through the little thing's head, killing it and pinning it to the wall. The demon dog is also incredibly weird looking. Uh, Bobby Rhodes, who played a pimp in Demons, is also in this movie. He plays a workout instructor in this one. He always plays the badass character that tries to keep everyone alive, and he unfortunately fails both times. His handlebar mustache is incredible, though. Like the first movie, this one also features a bunch of scenes with some punks speeding down the road in a car. I guess Lamberto just really likes punks in cars. And a final shout-out, the music in this movie is amazing. Being of the 80s era, it's just incredible and really ties everything together. I would definitely say go watch this one, and if you haven't seen Demons, give that a shot too. And speaking of Demons, I'm going to quote the one thing I remember uh, very well from that movie. N-O-S? Nostradamus's Tomb! Number 7, The Slumber Party Massacre, 1982, directed by Amy Holden Jones. A group of high school girls decide to throw a party while a crazed killer is on the loose, which ends with most of them becoming corpses. Russ Thorne, the escaped madman, is the killer. The movie predominantly features a drill as the murder tool. A butcher knife is also used in some instances, but this is a showcase for the drill. There's another movie I've been eyeing called The Driller Killer, which I will probably watch sometime this month. Personally, I don't find drills to be the most terrifying murder weapon. They're loud, clunky, and I feel they are normally only effective uh, when the killer sneakily gets behind somebody. But, you know, when he has that first kill, everyone else in the house is going to be like, Hey, there's somebody doing something weird with the drill. You guys hear that loud-ass drilling sound? I, I bet someone with the drill is going to try to murder us. Let's be careful in order to not get killed by this person with this loud-ass drill. Anyways, at one part of the movie, 
the neighbor that is supposed to be watching over the girls teases a meat cleaver which she is using to kill snails of all things but after his death it never really pops back up there's a scene where a pizza is delivered and upon opening the door a dead pizza boy just falls into the house with holes drilled into his eyes and this later prompts one of the girls to eat the pizza on his dead body and you know what I respect that Overall, this is a fun sword slasher that you can put on. The gore effects are nothing to write home about, but it's a good time. This is the first movie of the month that is directed by a woman. I think it is really cool to see horror movies from differing perspectives. This was Amy Holden Jones' directorial debut. She went on to write Mystic Pizza and the best movie featuring a St. Bernard as the main character, Beethoven. And that's going to be it for the first week. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any critiques, recommendations, or questions, let me know down below. I'm Josh Baker, and this has been Blank is the Killer.